Well, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Charles Vinnick, the executive director of the Whale Sanctuary Project, and I want to welcome you today. We've had quite a few people register for this uh, webinar, and we're very pleased that you're interested in the topic and that you're following our work. I'm here with Dr. Amanda Babin, our Nova Scotia environmental analyst. And what you're seeing behind me on the virtual screen is our Port Hilford Sanctuary site. And we'll be talking more about that site throughout this webinar. Now, Amanda, perhaps you could tell everyone a little bit about your background and what brought you to the Whale Sanctuary Project. Sure. Um, so I'm a aquatic biologist, meaning that I have experience both in freshwater and marine waters, including marine mammals. Uh, so I did my master's on the impacts of underwater noise on harbor porpoises. And I came to the Whale Sanctuary because I like to say I'm part of the free willy generation. And I was just very excited when uh, Charles gave a town hall here to shake his hand and say thank you. And that turned into this opportunity. So thank you very much. Well, we're very glad to have you. You're doing exceptional work. And I think everyone on the webinar today will get a chance to understand the work that you're doing and how important that is for all of the work that we're doing to create the sanctuary. So this will be a conversation really between Amanda and myself. She'll be doing most of the presenting and I'll of course jump in to confuse her whenever I can. Uh, and we invite you to pose questions on the Q&A panel on Zoom. And we'll move to the Q&A primarily after the main presentation. So with that, I'd like to share my screen and we can um, get started. So let me bring this to full screen. And basically, the reasons that we do the environmental analyses that we're going to be talking about today uh, are for a number of reasons. Now, of course, we started with a bunch of criteria, a number of critical environmental factors that we wanted for any site we would consider as a sanctuary. And those are primarily the items that you see on the page. We were looking for 100 acres or 40 hectares of space, of water space. We're looking for an area with suitable depth that has a lot of good tidal flow and current flow to move water through the environment for reasons we'll be talking about a little later. We want an area that's environmentally and ecologically balanced. That's basically good quality, high quality for the whales. We're looking for uh, an area from a community standpoint that is one that wants to embrace the sanctuary. And that's definitely what we found with Sherbrooke and with the people of Port Hilford. And then one where the, in, the local residents, the fishers, the stakeholders, those who use the waterway wanna work with us to help create the best possible environment, the best habitat for the whales. So that's really what we're doing. Now, why do we do the in-depth work that we're talking about today? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, and of course, perhaps the most important one, is that we want an environment that will enable the whales to thrive. We want to provide them the highest quality of life that we possibly can. So we want to know everything about the environment that we can. And we'll be talking about a lot of that as we go forward. Now, also, we want to make sure that nothing we're doing will have a negative impact on that environment. So we're studying it to know what the baseline is and what changes could impact it. Now, we also need to do this in order to provide the data to the permitting agencies. So they require that we provide them with an environmental analysis of the environment, what's often called an environmental impact statement. And then it's also important that we gather data, not all of the data that we're talking about, but some of the data to inform the engineering that we're gonna to do to decide where and how to deploy nets and where our infrastructure should be deployed both on the shoreline and in the water. So that's kind of the background for everything we're going to be talking about today. 
And with that, I'd like to move on. Let's see if we can make this work. All right. So this is basically a timeline that we'll be talking about uh, throughout this session. And we started, as many of you know, looking at over 100 sites throughout the latter part of 2018 and all of 2019. Looked at over 100 sites, and we centered on Port Hilford in really the latter part of 2019 and began to do some additional work in that regard. So we started doing depth surveys and the like that we'll be talking about. And then the rest of the work that we just want to introduce to you to show you what we're going to be talking about today is coming up on the screen as we speak to bring you into all of the work that we're going to be talking about throughout this webinar. But we started in October of 2019 doing some depth surveys to make sure that the environment was deep enough for the whales to be able to dive. And that was that first bit of work we were doing back then. So with that, let's move on. And perhaps, Amanda, you can take it from here and tell us a little bit about this work. Yes. Uh, so I want to start by thanking the fisher that helped us with this work. Hugh McDonald took us out on his boat, True Spirit, to collect some preliminary depth data. So what you're seeing here, the little dots show a gradient of colors, and those represent a gradient of depths. So the lighter colors are more shallow depths and the darker colors are our deeper depths. And this is important, um, as Charles said, for engineering purposes, but also to understand the seafloor and, and how the whales might interact with it. For example, you can see just up from Barishaw Island, there's an area where um, the depths are, are kind of variable. So it'll be interesting to see what's going on in that seafloor in more detail, which we'll talk about later with the multi-beam survey. All right, so moving, let's see here, that's not working, there we go. So that's the work we were doing in October of 19. And now we'll move on to some other work and perhaps you can describe what this will be as we move into it. Right, yeah, so the next thing we did was started a, a protocol of regular site visits. And again, I have to thank James Anderson and Amy Simon. They were the two going out throughout the winter and all this summer following a protocol that we agreed upon together. So if you move to the next slide, Charles, we can show them. Um, they would go to the area about twice a week in the winter time and take photos and videos from a standardized location so that we could literally put these things side by side and have a, a good comparison of a, a nice sunny day. And then the one on the right is actually from Hurricane Teddy just back in September. But they were also following a protocol of gathering all sorts of other information about what the weather was doing and how it was impacting the water. And what's the scale that they look at in that regard, Amanda? What is the scale that they're trying to compare to that you've given them guidance on and, and done a little training in how to do this work? Yeah, it's, um, it, it is a range. So we're interested in the entire bay, so to speak. That would be the largest scale that they're looking at. Um, but mostly they're focused on the western shore. So this is a, a point from the western shore looking toward the mouth of the bay, which is blocked in this view by Barishaw Island. So that's really the focus, is this area off the western shore where we know in some co configuration uh, the sanctuary will be. And are they looking at the waves? Are they looking at the current, the winds? What are the, what are the things they mm -hmm. try to bring you data about? Yeah, there's, there's a whole slew of things. So they're out there with uh, a compass and um, they're measuring wave heights as best they can. Also, uh, one of the reasons why we're doing this so often in the wintertime was to keep an eye out for ice, which luckily we never saw in any great amount. Um, and then at the same time, we're in touch so that when I'm back home, I can look up all a lot more information online at the exact moment that they're at the site to see you know, what's going on in terms of wind speed, direction, uh, the marine forecast just offshore and trying to compare all these things at a much larger scale to what's going on to the, our actual site. Very good. So, so 
Go ahead. Go ahead. No, please. In February, we announced the site and went public. We had a press conference on February 25th. And then on February 26th, we were in Sherbrooke and had a community meeting and basically a party to celebrate the site announcement. And uh, shortly thereafter, of course, everything shut down basically the following week in terms of our ability from the states to come to Nova Scotia. But then the advantage of having Amanda, Amy, James, and others all helping us locally enabled Amanda to continue guiding this work and taking it forward. So with that, we'll start talking about Amanda, the next subject. Right, so shortly after um, that announcement, we started measuring water temperature and water level pretty much continuously since March, and this is all ongoing. Right, so again, we have a photo here of Hugh McDonald. Big thank you. He helped us put out multiple vertical lines of rope throughout the bay. And at the bottom of that rope would be a pressure sensor. That's the silver thing that you're seeing on the right-hand side. And that measures the pressure of the water, which can be um, um, calculated into water level or what the wave heights are doing. And then along the vertical depth of the, the rope, we would place multiple um, temperature sensors. So these are measuring the, the water temperature. So we now have a, a fairly long record of what the water temperature and level are doing. And I just pulled up this one example of one day here. This is the water level over one day. And what I wanted to point out is that if you compare the blue dots, which are the uh, data from our water level logger to the orange dots, which are what the tide are doing uh, in Port Bickerton, which is about seven kilometers away, the next bay over, so to speak. So we could just kind of settle for reading the tide gauge, but we wanted to have a better understanding of what's going on in our bay where there isn't a tide gauge. So if you just focus in on uh, the middle of this graph around noon, you can see that the low tide in the orange is a little bit higher than what we actually experienced in Port Hilford. That's the blue. So that goes a little bit lower than you would expect. And then if you follow those lines up to the next high tide, it was a little bit higher than you'd expect. So we actually found that the tidal range according to the tide gauge in Port Bickerton was about 2.1 meters. But over time um, in Port Hilford, it's a little bit bigger, it's about three meters. So with this, we can actually cr uh, create a correction table. So if there's any sailors out there, you'll know what that is and maybe find it useful. Again, this will be useful to understand the range of temperatures that the whales are going to experience, as well as the range of water level, how basically it's a little bit of a roller coaster ride at, at times. Let's see if I can. So, with that, then um, let's take it on to the next subject here, Amanda. Yeah, and this is a big one. One more click, I think. There we go. So this is showing all of the times over the seasons, uh, starting in February and ending in October, that we have taken both marine and freshwater samples, as well as algae samples and plankton samples at times. Um, and this, this was important because we wanted to understand whether the water was of a high quality for the animals that are there currently and for the, the whales that we want to bring in. Um, and we would link what's happening to the freshwater streams that are coming into the bay with what's happening with the salt water that's in the bay. So if we move on to, yeah, there's a photo here. This is Hugh and I out on his boat um, just the day after the hurricane. And you can see I'm holding this, this gray bottle. This is called a Niskin bottle that we use to um, take water samples. And then Hugh's holding a, a bottle there, um, plastic, and you can see a few more at the bottom of the photo. These are bottles that come from the lab and they have preservatives in them. 
So we fill them all up at each site and they're standardized sites throughout the season. Seasons, I should say. And then we bring them back to the lab promptly. And if you can see this, uh, this list here, every single one of these things is measured out of each of those water samples. So we get a good idea of what's going on in terms of water quality. You can pick out a couple in there. You're looking at things like pH. You're looking at different metals like aluminum. And again, it just gives us a, a good baseline rounded view of the water quality, which is of a good quality. Great. And then the next thing I think is a bit of, oh yes, okay. Freshwater survey. This is um, right bang in when COVID hit. And so if you go to the next slide, you'll notice um, a helper for me. This is my husband in the middle, Craig Babin. So he came out and we went around to every single one of the major freshwater inputs into the bay. And we measured the, the width, and the depth. And we also measured how fast the water was going. And we did all of this during the spring melt. So that's when the water would be highest and you would have the most amount of fresh water coming into the bay. So that's what that um, gives us is if we multiply those three factors together, you get something called discharge. So that's the amount of fresh water coming into the bay. And then we also looked at these sources um, by doing a little dance in the stream. This is actually a, a standardized method. It's called cabin, if anybody's interested. But you, you um, sample a known area for a specific amount of time. And what you get out of it is all of these little critters, which are actually invertebrates that live in the stream. And then what we did is sorted all of those invertebrates into different groups uh, based on whether or not they were tolerant to pollution. So for example, I zoomed in on this big caddis fly here. This bug is really interesting because he cocoons himself in uh, leaves and twigs and things like that to stay safe. But it's good to see this guy because he's very intolerant to pollution, meaning he wouldn't be there if it was a low water quality. And in fact, we found that at every stream, at least 70% of the invertebrates um, were of this type, not specifically caddis flies, but of the groups that are intolerant to pollution. So this tell us, tells us in a biologically relevant way that the water quality is good. Okay, here is a little bit of a desktop uh, survey that I did. We were interested in learning about the biodiversity of the area. So if we flip forward, um, this is just one example, but I, we actually went to 16 different sources, different databases um, that catalog what species are in the local area and also along the Eastern shore and into the Atlantic Ocean. But I just pulled out this one example for you because some of you might find it of interest this is a way that you can actually help uh, understand the biodiversity wherever you are in Canada, in fact. It's called inaturalist.ca. And this is the bay uh, where you can see that a few locals have already signed on. And they just, you know, during their daily walks or whatever, they log whenever they see a species that they recognize. So we looked at all different groups, right from cetaceans which means whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and pinnipeds, which means seals, all the way down to plants. And at the end of the day, what we found is that there were at least 295 species in the local area. But if you include the greater Eastern shore and into the Atlantic Ocean, we found over 3000 species. Okay, what's next? Right, so June was a busy month. We did uh, two things here that we're going to talk about. One of them is uh, near and dear to my heart because as I said earlier, I have a background in acoustics and acoustics are very important to whales. That's their primary sense that they use rather than vision. And then we also did a land use survey, which I'll talk about after that. Okay, so starting with the acoustic survey, 
like Charles said, it's really important to measure baseline levels. So in this case, we're measuring baseline noise levels. Um, we did this using a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone. And we did this in collaboration with a group called Force. Um, so what, what they did is deployed the hydrophone for two weeks during the lobster fishing season so that we could get a measure of the baseline noise levels and also the noise levels as the boats were moving around. So we have an example of what that sounds like. Right, so it might be a little bit hard uh, for somebody to decipher what that noise might mean. And so to help us out, we visualize the sound using this graph. This is an example of the noise that we picked up. Um, it's called a spectrogram. And I'll explain it a little bit. What we have is time along the bottom and frequency along the side. Frequency you can think of as pitch. So being a really low frequency or really high frequency. And then the colors represent the amplitude or the volume. So the, the cool blues are quiet sounds, and then the yellows and reds are getting into the louder noises. The other thing I, yeah. Go ahead with your, your comment, then I'll chime in. I just wanted to finish explaining what you're seeing here. On the left, you'll notice there's uh, brackets and those represent the frequency ranges that humans use in terms of what we can hear and what we vocalize in uh, versus what different whale species use, which you can see is a much higher frequency. And we've actually had a question from Connie sent to us in advance of the webinar asking about whether or not sonar would harm cetaceans. And actually she mentions that she's read and she's correct that there are sonar tests and use of sonar that can be impacting cetaceans, whales and dolphins negatively. And so is there a concern that the work we did and we are doing in an ongoing way would impact critters and particularly whales and dolphins locally in a negative way? And the answer is that you can certainly see it in this graph that the sonar we're using is not the type of sonar that would have a negative impact on whales. Those, those sonars usually are much higher volume and they're in a different pitch. Now, I've actually been a, uh, an expert witness in some of the legal challenges that some of the environmental groups in the US have brought with some of the Navy sonar testing. And so that's very loud, very deep sonar that's used for military exercises and has proven to be harmful to whales in certain, in certain uses. But in this case, the work that we're doing uh, really is, is not work that would have any impact on any of the animals. It's really a very modest amount of sonar that we're using in that regard. Now, we'll also be putting out um, these kinds of sensors, not only during our testing period, but we're also planning an array later when we're actually active and we have whales in the area so that we will be able to uh, know whether there are other animals coming in because with this kind of data, with this kind of equipment, we can also hear other activity. So it gives us a way of listening to the acoustic environment. And that'll be part of the research we'll be doing in an ongoing way. Right, and because acoustics are so important for whales, sorry, if we could back up a moment, I just wanted to explain that we are measuring the, the noise levels according to what we hear, but also um, applying an equation, it's called a weighting function, um, that describes what the whales hear. So we know the volume that would be impacting them as well. Okay, so the next thing that popped up there is the land use survey. I know it's a little small to see the text, but don't worry. I just wanted to show that um, most of this area is covered in green, which means that these are naturally forested areas. 
Uh, you'll see a little bit of red. Those are also forested, but they're treated stands. So they're under silviculture. And then there's areas of purple that you might be able to see as well. Those are areas that um, people have houses. So maybe you're watching from one of those areas right now. And also there's um, a little bit of pink in there and those represent agricultural areas. But it's our understanding from the locals that some of these areas are no longer in use. So it could be that uh, the data set that, I, that we got this from the, the provincial Nova Scotia government might be a little bit outdated. So the, it's important to uh, talk to the locals as well and see what's going on. And this just gives us uh, the big picture of the context of the area that this site will be going into. Okay, so last but not least, this is a lot of work that's taken a few months and, and the data crunching is going to happen over the winter. So we wanted to create a hydrodynamic model to understand the dynamics of how the water moves throughout the bay. And you need a lot of different data to go into that model, but two of the main things you need are ADCP data and multi-beam data, and I'll explain each of those. So the first is the ADCP. And this uses sound again to measure the water current in the profile of the water column. So it measures it at various depths in great detail. And what it's actually measuring in, in both, both cases, we have surface ADP on the left, which is pointed down, and we have a bottom mounted ADCP on the right, which is pointed up. And they're both measuring the water speed and direction. And again, I just wanna say a shout out here to Doug McDonald, Hugh, Hugh's son on the right there, that's uh, holding the bottom mounted ADCP that helped us deploy that. And then the second piece of the puzzle is the multi-beam. And this uh, was towed throughout the bay over quite a large area and it maps out the seafloor in very great detail. So that kind of creates a container um, for the model. And then you put into it what the water current is doing. And we have an example of what the output, output might look like. So this is an example of a hydrodynamic model that I used during my PhD. What you're seeing here is actually a bend of the St. John River. And the arrows are representing the direction and the speed of water. So the direction of the arrow is the direction of the water and the length of the arrow is the speed of the water. And you'll notice that the arrows are, are going back and forth and they'll do that in, in the bay as well as the tide goes in and out. And we'll have this kind of model image for various depths. So again, this uh, helps us understand what the whales are going to experience in terms of the very dynamic uh, ocean. And it also gives us a real picture of what the whole area, what the bay is beneath the surface. And with that, we'll be able to see whether there are anomalies that we need to be, uh, that we need more data about. We'll be able with this to identify areas where we may want to do underwater video, send an underwater drone down to take, take video, because we want to understand whether there are uh, different outcroppings below, there may be some different plants that are growing somewhere. You know, there could be something that was put in the water at some point, an old car could be down there somewhere. Anything we need to find, doing the work that we've been doing over this last really month and a half, and the work we'll do with video since will show us whether there's anything there. We don't expect to find anything, but it will begin to outline for us whether there are things we need to be aware of as we plan the precise location for the nets and for our infrastructure and basically where within the bay, the sanctuary will be located. So with that. Yeah, so I just uh, put together this slide of everybody that's helped us out this summer. I wanna thank them by name. So in the upper left, you have Hugh and his family. They've been a great help. We have Amy Simon as well and James Anderson, who've done a lot of work. In the bottom left, you have the team from the Nova Scotia Community College. 
They're led by Dr. Tim Webster, and they helped us out with the hydrodynamic model. And then we also have Lee Wei Marine, um, who helped deploy some of the temperature loggers. We have Force, uh, who did the uh, hydrophone work, as I mentioned earlier. And we just worked with Kaiser Marine to pull the ADCP out of the water because that's quite a heavy bottom mounted piece of equipment. So thank you to everybody. All right, so with that, we're, we're back larger on screen and we can begin to open it up to questions. And so uh, certainly there are a number that are coming through. Uh, one of the questions that we had is uh, early on I saw is, with the data sets that we have, and particularly the desktop ones you've used, Amanda, how many years of data going back did you find that you had access to? And what does that say about giving you a, a broad longitudinal picture of some of the data? Right, yeah. So of course it depends on the data set, um, but some of them go back to the 1970s. I think one of them even reaches as far as the 1920s in terms of what water temperatures are, um, the tidal ranges, of course, and also ICE, the Canadian Ice Service holds an archive, and we've examined every single one of those ice charts over the years to see what's going on as well. So one of the questions we also had before, we, before the webinar started with, will you have a program which is geared for release of whales as a as well as keeping them in sanctuary. Well, I think what, what everyone needs to understand is that the great majority of the animals that are in captivity, of the orca and of the beluga that are in captivity, they're not candidates for release. Uh, they have none of the survival skills that uh, whales have in the wild. Many of them, in fact, most of them have never eaten live fish. They don't know that a live fish is food. With Keiko, it took quite a long time before he realized that when we were putting a live fish in the water, it was actually food. He would chase it, he might even capture it, but he would bring it back and open his mouth and give it back to us. So he did learn over time that fish is our food and live fish could be caught and he did sustain himself on them. But that was a very unusual experience and we believe that virtually all of the animals that would be candidates for a sanctuary would in fact remain in sanctuary for, their, for the rest of their lives. Now we do work with other experiences. Last year we had the privilege of going to Russia and actually working with the Russian government and Russian activists to help release 97 whales that had been captured illegally for sale to marine parks and through that work, the government made the decision to release them. And we helped on that decision and on the protocols for their release. And through that work of the Russian activists, all of those whales are not being sold to marine parks to extend what obviously is a practice that we wanna see end. So certainly we're involved in that kind of work, but the whales that will come to the sanctuary will really be there for their lives so that they can have a high quality of life and thrive in a natural habitat. So other questions that we're seeing, uh, is this site expected to host both orca and beluga whales? Well, the site can certainly hold both. As you can see, it's a very large site. Now, we expect that the whales that would first become available will be belugas. And that's our focus for this sanctuary. Should there be an orca that would be available and in need of sanctuary, then we would wanna work with the community to see how that can be, how, a, how an orca can be accommodated. And certainly were that to happen, orca and beluga would be completely separated one from the other. They would never be in the same space and there would be multiple nets and the like. But our expectation is that the sanctuary would house around eight, six to eight beluga whales. And why do we say six to eight? And it's directly relevant to all the work that Amanda has been talking about because it's based on the carrying capacity of the environment. 
So that's from a desktop standpoint, what we've been planning all along based on how much space the whales need. And in fact, also about, and there was a question earlier, what happens to whale waste in an area like this? So part of the reason we look at all the data about how the water moves, what the currents are, what the tidal flow is, to understand how whale waste, poop if you will, is moved through the area. And the poop of whales is generally more gelatinous, it's not as much solid, and it disperses quite readily in the environment. But all of that has been taken into account in planning for the number of whales and in site selection to be sure that this is an environment that will remain pristine, if you will, and high quality for the whales and for the habitat that they're gonna be in. So we have a question here about what current speeds did we see in the bay? Do you have any of that data, Amanda, you can speak to a bit? No, I don't. We, like, we just pulled the ADCP out of the water uh, last week and NSCC will be doing the data crunch over the winter. And actually that hydrodynamic model that, that you could have seen it on the timeline that we're waiting eagerly for really won't be available until really the beginning of till February. So we'll try to encourage them to move as quickly as possible, but that's the timeline that the, the folks at Nova Scotia Community College that are crunching those numbers have said we can look forward to. So we have um, a question here from Chelsea about what are the selected, or where are the selected creatures currently located? So, all of the whales that we're expecting to come to the sanctuary are currently in marine parks. Now there are many marine parks that they're in. And we're reaching out to marine parks to develop relationships with them. So where people might think we're pointing fingers and saying they're doing the wrong thing, that's really not the case at all. Uh, really what this is about is a paradigm shift in public opinion about how we should keep whales in captivity. And just as there have been sanctuaries created for elephants, for big cats, for chimpanzees and other animals, it's now time to create them for whales and dolphins. So we're in conversation, in discussion with marine parks. Our doors are open for those conversations and we look forward to them joining with us to identify whales that should come to the sanctuary. And the process that we would follow is to have their caregivers, the people the whales trust, join in transporting them to a sanctuary and working with us over time so that the whales always feel, and they do feel, they have emotions like we do, and they, they are comfortable with certain of the people they've been working with. So we would look forward to partnerships with them to bring them into whales through a very stringent protocol where every whale is evaluated by for their health in advance. We work with them over time to get them used to the cradle they would go in for transport and prepare them for transport to a sanctuary. So it's an actually quite an involved process. We have experts on our team who have worked on this over many years, and that's the way in which we would bring them to a sanctuary. Well, Amanda, if you're seeing questions you want to jump in and answer, don't hesitate. Okay. Um, actually, I saw one that you might like to pick up about how can hurricanes affect whales? You have some experience with that? Well, I do. I've, uh, having spent all those years in, in Iceland, not necessarily hurricanes, but a good average winter day was a challenge for us as well. We often had 100-kilometer winds, uh, around the area in Kletzvik Bay that we were keeping Keiko. And what we found was that the winds and the waves certainly in many respects were a huge challenge for our nets, for the infrastructure, for all of that. But in fact, almost never was it a problem for Keiko. The winds and the wave would come splashing up. He would just swim right into them. He would jump out of the water, do a little spy hop, and he seemed to be enjoying it tremendously. We, on the other hand, were hanging on for dear life, but 
he seemed to enjoy it all the time. So I think part of what that shows is it demonstrates the care you have to give in creating the infrastructure. We've selected this bay because of the way in which it protects uh, the nets and the net locations. Bearshaw Island, as you've seen in some of the pictures and that Amanda pointed out, provides some protection. And there's even protection from some underwater uh, outcroppings and, and basically little reefs and rocks from the southeast. So we think, and what we've seen in the hurricane last year and in Hurricane Eddie and Teddy this year, that uh, we think this is an excellent and an ideal location for the sanctuary. There's another question kind of along those lines. They're asking, uh, what about ice and its effect on whales? And the answer to that is over your shoulder. Um, so like I said, we did, um, we, we looked at the Canadian Ice Service archive as far back as it goes. And we also had folks on site um, multiple times throughout the winter, multiple times a week, in fact. And this is pretty much what we saw. There wasn't much more than that little bit of thin ice on top, which would not be a problem for the whales. I also see a question here from, uh, from Jasmine about the, she lives in the Pacific Northwest and she's certainly loves the resident orca pods, the Southern residents there. And she's been reading about how often they compete in tanks with one another. And she asks, are we concerned about the belugas coming into the sanctuary and how they might compete with one another? And it's an excellent question. So one of the ways in which we're looking to bring residents to the sanctuary is that we would look to bring two whales together that are used to living together. And they would come as a pair, if you will, into the sanctuary they would get used to it over a number of months. Were we to add additional whales, there would be a segmented area and we've already designed different segments within the 100 acres. So initially, the next two pair, the next two whales, the next pair, would not be interacting immediately with those that are already there. They would get used to one another acoustically. We would observe their behaviors and then we would open them up to live together based on those observations of their behavior. And that would happen successively with each group of whales that we bring together. Now, it may be that some would never feel comfortable with one another, and we'd keep some of the segments in the sanctuary. And that's all determined based on the welfare of the whales, which comes first for every decision we make. Looking at other questions here. I see one about, um, they're asking if there will be a live cam set up at the sanctuary. Well, we're looking forward to more than one. We're looking forward to underwater cameras and above water cameras, both to provide data to the animal caregivers, the resident staff of, of, the, uh, of the sanctuary, so we know what's happening at all times but also as a major part of our educational program. So we see that there'd be an interpretation center for the sanctuary. It might not be directly on site. It could be on the Eastern shore over along Marine Drive. It might be in the town of Sherbrooke. All of that location or that kind of an interpretation center will be decided through our consultations with the local communities and what's best for the, for the local area. But we do see all of this underwater footage, the underwater cam, a live cam, if you will, can be beamed back to schools, to our interpretation center. And actually, kind of my dream is that we would have whales coming from a marine park, and we would be able then to beam back to that marine park how those whales are behaving, what their lives are like in the sanctuary. So people at marine parks are then learning about whale behavior, not by watching shows and the like at the, at the marine park, but rather about how whales behave in nature in a sanctuary. So we see all of this as part of our, our educational program going forward. What other questions are you seeing, Amanda? Yeah, there's a really important one here from Ron that lives in the area. 
And he's asking about uh, the onshore infrastructure and how that will be, um, will be collaborating with the locals on those decisions. Yeah, very much. So we have not made any determination yet as to exactly where the nets will be positioned. We know we'll be on the western side of Port Hilford and along, along the western shoreline and probably closer, much closer to Barishaw Island than, let's say, to the beach. The beach is quite a ways away. And the, the bay itself from Barishaw Island in is a little more than three square kilometers and we'll be using pretty much less than one half of a square kilometer. So that's the net enclosures. And then we would be building either onshore or potentially actually on the water on a dock kind of uh, structure, our observation posts, our veterinary uh, building, our medical lab, all of our husbandry work, and also certainly the security and the uh, marine operations uh, structures that are needed for the staff. There was a question earlier uh, about how many staff will there be? Well, I think there'll be around 20 full-time staff members. There'll be some part-time and summer interns when things are the weather is such that there'll be more activity. There'll be full-time veterinary staff, full-time husbandry staff, so every whale that comes to the sanctuary will receive a complete medical uh, analysis and all of that medical history will be known before we determine whether a given whale is an appropriate candidate for the sanctuary. And we will be doing medical evaluations of the whales in an ongoing way. So among the staff that could come, we've already been in discussion with the veterinary school, the veterinary uh, college uh, here in Nova Scotia, actually at PEI. And we've talked about the potential for internships and residency for veterinarians to come and do their residency at the sanctuary. Today, if anywhere in the world, if a veterinarian is interested in doing cetacean work, they tend to go to a marine park for their residency. We've got an opportunity for them to come to a sanctuary and do that in a natural habitat. So that's a tremendous opportunity for veterinarians as well. Mm -hmm. So there'll always be full-time medical care. There'll always be a full-time veterinarian on staff. And we'll have security people to mine the nets. We have to clean the nets on a regular basis. There'll be marine operations people who are responsible for that. And certainly there'll be animal husbandry staff as well. All of the locations of any of this structural work, the architecture, if you will, and the design will be done in the coming months, hand in hand with the local community, and particularly with those individuals who use the water more than others or who live in the immediate surrounding area. Charles, I don't think we've um, covered where we are with permitting yet. Someone's asking about permission to do this work. Sure. So the, the lead permitting agency has been designated as the Department of Lands and Forestry. For those of you who've been to our community meetings over the last year, you've heard us talking about uh, provincial fisheries and aquaculture being the, the lead permitting agency. Well, that changed in August when we learned that there was some concern that a permit through fisheries and aquaculture was dependent upon the permittee, in this case, the sanctuary, creating a product. Well, we don't create a product. So at that point, the agencies and the, and the provincial government determined that lands and forestry would be the lead agency. We've begun that process. We've been submitting information. In fact, a lot of the information you've heard us talk about today has been shared with them as well as our plans and, and other requirements for their initiation of the permit. So we've started that process and all of the other agencies, again, Fisheries and Aquaculture, DFO, Transport Canada, Environment, all of the other agencies will be what they call partner agencies with them participating in the analysis of our permit uh, request. 
So that's begun. It's ongoing. Uh, I'm actually here in Nova Scotia. I'm in quarantine. The requirement in Canada is, and it's a great one, you spend 14 days in, uh, in isolation when you arrive. So I'm in a hotel in Halifax. I get food. In fact, Amanda showed up on Sunday and left food outside my door so I could cook. And uh, things can be left by my door. But basically, I'm in isolation. And the reason to do that is that so we, at the end of this two weeks, when I'm uh, able to go out and meet with people, I'll be able to do more of this consultation with the local community, with the fishers, with other uh, people who are using this environment, as well as with the permitting agencies to move that process along. Because we felt we've reached a stage where while Zoom works great for certain things, it's wonderful for a webinar, it's not particularly helpful for some of the kinds of consultation that we need to begin to do now. So that's certainly ongoing as well. So there are lots of questions. Uh, let's try to take a few more. Oh, people have, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You're, you're reading more quickly than I am. Please. <laughs> just, just a few people have asked the same question about uh, whether we would anticipate breeding in the sanctuary. And of course, that's not something that we want to propagate. Good use of the term. Um, <laughs> but yes, no, there will, be, there will be no breeding. When we talk about an authentic sanctuary, it's really an environment where the whales can thrive. It's an environment that every decision we make is made with their welfare first and foremost. And certainly we don't want to continue to have more whales in, in any kind of a captive environment. We want them in the wild. These can't be released, so certainly we're creating a sanctuary for them. But we don't want to create more whales in this environment. So we will do all of the ways, and there are many ways that are looked at in terms of um, birth control for the whales so that there are no there's no breeding in this environment. And, uh, you know, in many respects, we want to go out of business. But there are so many whales in captivity that certainly not in my life, not in a minute, will that be the case. That's the goal. And it's important to remember breeding in any way. You're just freezing there a little bit, Charles, but I think they got the gist. Um, he was saying not within his lifetime or mine will this issue be over. Um, you're unfrozen now, but if I could pick up on a question that Cheryl posted, she was just um, congratulating us for being able to do this work during COVID. And uh, thank you for that. It took a lot of work, um, but also another opportunity to thank everybody that helped. You'll notice some of those photos we were wearing masks and uh, keeping as distant as we could on these boats. So it was a challenge, but I'm also quite pleased with what we were able to get done. So there's also a question here from Robin as to whether we're still considering developing a, a, a sanctuary in the Pacific Northwest. And so uh, our focus very much, I mean, this is a very big task. And our focus is on the sanctuary here in uh, Port Hilford and in Nova Scotia. And that's taking virtually all of our energy and time. I do want to mention, though, that there is quite an effort going on simultaneously, led by the First Nation tribe, the Lummi, in uh, Washington State, to bring the whale from Miami Sea Aquarium that's been known as Lolita, that they have given a tribal name, Scully Shaktanaw, to her, and they're working to bring her back to the Pacific Northwest. That's been an effort that many people uh, have been working on for quite, quite a long time. Howie Garrett has been leading that effort for, for many years. But I think the Lummi are approaching it from a cultural standpoint that may have some bearing in law and in, in culture that may have a better chance of succeeding. So we are helping develop the protocols for transport, for how she could be 
uh, move to a, a, an enclosure, in this case, a bay pen and a more than a, a sanctuary initially, and potentially be reunited with her family. Her mother is, from all we know, although the DNS, DNA tests are not confirmed, her mother appears to still be alive. So there's a lot, lot of effort in that regard. And Bree is also asking about Corky, another 50 plus year old whale at uh, uh, SeaWorld in San Diego, whether she would be ever considered as a whale for uh, release, if you will, back to her family. And there are a lot of efforts taking place in many respects in this way. There's some work going on uh, really. And I, I see that uh, there's earlier I saw this will be come back to it that Michael Reppy was on earlier and Michael's working in in British Columbia to develop an area that could possibly be a sanctuary for Corky. So there's lots of efforts going on in this regard and we're involved and engaged with as many as we can be, but our focus on building a sanctuary right now, a full sanctuary is in Nova Scotia and Port Hilford. So we have time for a few more questions. Amanda, are you seeing some that you want to respond to? Mm, there's a question here about transport by land, plane, boat, or all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Depends where they're coming from. We, we took Keiko from the Oregon Coast Aquarium in Newport, Oregon, to uh, Vespinar, a small island off the coast of Iceland in a C-17. Uh, that the uh, Air Force leased to us. First time that ever happened where the Air Force leased a transport plane to a private group. Uh, and C-130s have been used extensively to move whales from park to park. SeaWorld has certainly moved them among their parks with C-130s. There are whales in, uh, no, in uh, Niagara Falls, Canada, more than 50 belugas in marine land of Canada and Kiska, one orca. From that location, it would be possible to do land transport. So all of those would depend on where the whales are coming from, what is best for the welfare of the whales, and how we can do it most efficiently and effectively. And again, we do have members of the team who've been involved in all of those methods of transport. And then um, a question that was asked by at least two folks as well about where their food will be coming from. Well, the food will certainly, I mean, belugas eat, they eat many, many kinds of fish, but their often preferred diet is capelin and herring, occasionally other, other fish as well. We would be purchasing fish locally to every extent possibly if we had eight whales based on the fact that uh, the belugas would eat around 18 to 25 kilograms of, of fish a day, we would be looking to purchase around a ton of food a week. So we will be looking to the local fishers for uh, that supply. Uh, it would be frozen and then we thaw it for feeding to the whales and they're fed directly. It's not just in the way that aquaculture puts food and, and fish meal, if you will, into the environment, our whales are fed directly. And so there's nothing going into the environment. There are no additives. We're feeding them uh, basically human grade fish, the best we can find in every case. And so all of that would be part of the protocol for how we're purchasing and feeding the whales. So there are a couple of other questions. We had uh, from a 14-year-old girl, Finlay from Australia, who was asking, uh, would there be a high bio load in the area and would that negatively impact the environment? So I think I, I answered most of that earlier, but the answer is that in selecting this environment and doing the measurements that Amanda has been speaking about, we're consciously making determinations so there will be no negative impact on the environment, both for the whales and for the surrounding area. Another question she asked is, would there be uh, any kind of human intervention with the whales? Will we be leaving them alone, if you will, or will we be providing enrichment? 
And it's actually a little bit of both. The environment is designed so that they can make their own choices. That's what an authentic sanctuary is. They choose how they spend their time. Now, we also want to create an environment that's as enriching as possible for them. So in that sense, having different depths, having rock outcroppings, all provides enrichment. Having a natural bottom where there are crabs and there are other critters that they can investigate, that's also enriching. Having storms and birds that come on the surface. Keiko always used to chase the birds across, across the bay. Our whales will likely do the same. But we'll also be providing human enrichment where we provide different experiences for them so that they're moving as well so that they're being enriched. And we also have to be able to interact with them to know how they're doing medically and to be sure that they're well in every way. And if one is ever sick, we're able to quarantine it. We have shore-based tanks that we can actually move a whale into if it ever needed to be quarantined. So in that regard, we have to have enough engagement with them so that we can do the work necessary for their well-being. And I think a couple of people have asked about release, and I think I mentioned it a number of times, but in, in, in no, uh, we don't have any expectation that any of these animals can be released. They've been in captivity their whole lives. As I mentioned, they don't have the survival skills. And so our expectation is that these animals are in sanctuary for their lives. Now, our facilities are such that we have capability to help if there's a whale or a cetacean, uh, even a, perhaps a, a large pinniped that is in need of help. And to the extent that working with the local organizations that are responsible for care of wild animals, if our, our team's expertise, our boats, or any of our facilities are needed in such an environment, we would want to think about how we can be most helpful for those other organizations that have that responsibility and that expertise. But our focus is, of course, on the residents that we will have in the sanctuary. So other questions? I think you've covered all the main topics that I'm seeing. I think here's one, would agricultural areas lead to harmful, harmful runoff? Well, there are certainly experiences where agricultural facilities have created pollution in water environments nearby. Now, we've been doing, as, as Amanda mentioned, all the freshwater analysis and analysis of the, of the saltwater, of the bay itself. We're not seeing anything that indicates that there is runoff into the bay that would be a concern. So that's, that's tremendous. We're, we're very pleased that that's what we're seeing. There's also very little agricultural activity close to the bay that's active. But we're taking a look at that. We don't see anything. We haven't yet, and we don't anticipate it. And in addition, this is a bay with great currents, a lot of tidal flow and the like. So uh, we, we don't see that at all. So let's see. So someone's telling me, oh, Ron, that's Ron, who lives just over my shoulder. You mentioned that earlier. Hi, Ron. That's great. So um, there's a question here, do wild belugas live nearby and do they come into this area? So most of the belugas in, uh, in the area are actually on the North Shore. They're on the Fundy Coast and up around Cape Breton uh, in that area. Only in very rare circumstances have basically lone belugas, belugas that are traveling alone, come into bays. There was one certainly in Guysboro Harbor years ago, who was there for a number of years, actually. Um, so we don't anticipate that there are local whales. We've certainly done a survey of all cetacean sightings in the area, 
and they are few and far between. The big whales, the right whales that come along the eastern shore stay miles offshore. Uh, we've talked to even turtle uh, experts and uh, there are, are no turtle sightings in this area of concern where they might be get caught in a net or something like that. But uh, we part of the reason we would put out hydrophone arrays is so that we would have advance warning if a cetacean is coming into the area or something we need to be aware of. And in that regard, with our teams, we would know how to respond to such an occurrence. And certainly there's a buffer zone as well between our net and the ability of boats or other things to come too close. So all of that's part of the planning as we go forward. So we've run a bit over our hour, but I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Uh, certainly, uh, we'll go through your questions and our, try to answer them directly as well online as we get a chance. Don't hesitate to be in contact with us by email, by uh, on our Facebook page. Amanda will answer all the hard questions. I'll deal with the easy ones. And in any way that we can respond, we certainly will. But thank you very much for joining us. Amanda, any final yes. word? Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much. And we look forward to continuing to talk with you and having more sessions like this. Thanks again. Bye for now.